Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I am Jody Grinwald. This week is very exciting because not only is my guest truly incredible for the work that she does each and every day, but she is coming to us from Sweden. Emily Joof is our first international podcast guest. Emily is a multicultural mom to two young children who have been her inspiration to write children's books. She moved to Sweden 10 years ago from London. She works as the global education advisor at Save the Children, while at the same time writing and publishing her stories with a focus on inclusion and diversity from an Afro-diasporan perspective. Emily is also doing her PhD on how children's books can build inclusion in preschools. Her newest titled book, Ballet with Heart, was inspired by her son. He was born with some health complications, and yet he was a perfect dancer from day one. She quickly noticed that because he was brown, people were incredibly prejudiced about his love of ballet. Emily says that writing picture books is rooted in her need as a mother to create this space for her children and other children to access a more realistic representation of the world we live in. Please subscribe to the Today's the Day Changemakers YouTube channel, stream on all streaming sites, follow and like Today's the Day Live It on Facebook and Instagram, and please join our Today's the Day Changemakers Facebook page for more inspiration and motivation. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it, and have a fabulous week, everyone. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Today is the Day Changemakers. Today, I am super excited because I have a wonderful person with me. Emily Joof is my guest today. Hi, Emily. How are you? Hi. So great to be here. So great to have you here. So let me read a little bit about your bio. Incredible bio. You moved to Sweden 10 years ago from London. Incredible. I'm excited you are our first international guest. So this is wonderful. She was as the Global Education Technical Advisor at Save the Children, while also writing and publishing stories with a focus on inclusion and diversity from an Afro-diasporan perspective. Emily is represented by a Swedish publisher and also self-publishes some of her titles throughout her independent publishing house, Bife. Right? Perfect. Yep. Uh, books. Okay. I was, I was practicing that. Emily is currently doing a P- part time PhD at Lancaster University in the UK. The focus of her research is, is on the impact that children's literature can have on fostering inclusion in preschools. Emily has a master's in education and international development from the University of London Institute of Education and a bachelor's degree in ancient history and social anthropology from the University College in London. Wow, Emily, that was mouthful and incredible. There's so much, so much to unpack here. So, so let's start from kind of the beginning. So you started your life in London. So that's where you lived in the beginning? Not at all. Ah. <laughs> all right, so we're going so, back. Yeah, so um, I was actually born in Lagos, Nigeria, in West Africa. And my parents were working there. So we were not Nigerian. We, we just happened to be there. Um, and from there, we moved to Brussels, Belgium, Paris, France, and then Banjul, the Gambia. Uh, and I actually moved to London. No. And then after that, we went to Paris. And then I went to London for university. So I moved to London when I was about 17. Wow. Um, yeah. Incredible, incredible background. So out of all of those places, do you have a favorite that you lived in? So... No, um, because they are all kind of pieces of home for me. Um, they all hold really strong memories and people I love and and I love different spaces for different things. Um, so no, I don't actually have a favorite. <laughs> so um, where, when you were younger, what were, what were your thoughts about what you were going to be when you grew up? So when I was six, I was going to be Diana Ross. I was pretty certain. Um, there was something just fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> about oh, Diana Ross. Um, but apart from that, um, I wanted to, to work for the UN. So uh, I was a, a kid in the 80s and there were quite a few global crises. So it was often on the news and um, you would see the, the, the UN soldiers with the blue helmets. And, and I asked my parents, what are they doing? And, and they gave me the child friendly version of, you know, the people that are there to protect, to support, particularly um, child centered um work and I thought well that's me um so I decided then that I would work with young people Mm. um and at some point I decided I was going to be a singer too but I hung on to that dream of working uh with children and I'm still doing that today so I'm pretty pleased I made one of them come true (laughs) (laughs) 
So did you take vocal lessons though? I have to ask this because my other side <laughs> of my life is all about music. So did you take vocal lessons at all? So I didn't, but I joined choir from age seven to probably 27, I've been singing in choirs um, and I never did take a class. So I can't read music, but I can definitely sing whatever you throw at me. It's one of those weird things. But yes, um, music is a big part of uh, of who I am, but I don't do it professionally or yeah, it's just for fun. That's okay. It's all about connection, right? You feel mm -hmm. connected when you do it. You know, those who yeah, are exactly. in the creative world, they, they need that. They thrive off of that. So that's good to mm -hmm. know that, um, that you're doing that. Awesome. So you decided you were going, you wanted to work with children. Did you have a direction in mind? Because I know, I know where you are now, but I'm just curious if this is where yeah. it ended, where you thought you were going to be. So it was, as I was growing up, it was a lot around child poverty. Um, so I, in my formative years, there was a lot of time spent in West Africa. And again, there were lots of crises around me. Um, there were lots of refugees that came into the Gambia when I was a teenager. And it just kind of opens your eyes to, um, the social injustices to way thing life is set up. And, and I was even more passionate about working in a field that um, could touch the lives of the most at risk because children really um, are often some of the most vulnerable in most situations. Um, so I was, I was thinking, yes, child poverty. And, and when I went to university, I didn't do a classic development degree. I thought I'd really like to understand people more because this is about people. And that's why I did um, anthropology and ancient history. And I did things like the history of culture. And it was really one of those waffly degrees where you finish and people are like, are you gonna work in a museum now? But, um, <laughs> but it was really, really quite useful because indeed I do work with people from different cultures and backgrounds and they all carry with them their history and their path. And it's really interesting um, and important to have a really broad perspective and also understanding of the person standing in front of you. So I worked uh, in development for a while, um, mainly NGOs or charities that work with children. And after a few years, I decided that education within that field was what was calling me the most. Um, so then I did the master's in education and development and have been working along that path ever since. Incredible. And, and I can see your passion in your face when you talk about how, you know, <laughs> and then the importance of the work that you do. Your position at Save the Children, how long have you been there? And can you share a little bit about what you do for them? Sure. Um, so I've been with them almost for three years. Um, it's a pretty big organization and I work in the Swedish office, but on international programs, which means that um, all the work I do are with countries outside Sweden. Um, and the focus of my work is actually on inclusive education. So in the countries we work in, we try and look, well, who's left out? Um, often they are ethnic minorities, children with disabilities. Um, they could be um, refugees or people on the move. And I try to work with colleagues on the ground to see how we can build a system that includes them. Uh, so that's one strand of my work. And the second is addressing violence in schools. So there's a lot of violence on, on a long scale from bullying, which is often seen as more acceptable, but also in countries where children are physically punished with a stick or, um, uh, or verbally, sometimes it could just be a certain kind of language that's used with children. Um, and I deliver some training around uh, what you can do instead, because it's all good to say, don't do this, but if people have been doing it, for years and it's been part of their training and education, um, then you have to give them an alternative. And, and in all my work, it's really been rather um, motivating to see teachers and education officials, they're, they're sold, they're game. They're like, of course, when this isn't the way we wanna be, but we really need tools on how to do something different. And I'm, I'm glad to be part of that process. Um, and now with COVID, I do a little bit um, on supporting different countries and their education systems to, to come back to school or to support school or learning at the home. So designing remote learning kits, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's kind of a bit of what I do. I have a couple of questions with that. So, you know, when you're going into these different areas where they're used to doing something a certain way, mm. coming in, what is it like for you, you know, and, and how accepting are they of the training of trying mm. to change the culture within mm. what you've been doing for such a long time? Mm. Um, 
very accepting. So today I haven't had any issues on that level. And I think it's because um, the way we approach this is we explain children's developmental stages. So for example, a four-year-old cannot sit for an hour. It doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> and so what we do is, is we bring in, we discuss the brain, we discuss um, children's temperaments, their developmental stages and what you can expect and not expect. And then we offer you an alternative so that you can really engage, uh, plan your lesson, uh, plan the structure of your classroom so that you really are able to reach your learner in a different way. Um, and I'm, I, I'm, I have to say, it's not a, it's not an uphill battle, really. People are ready, and and they're just happy to get the tools they need, like parents and teachers all over the world. Really, we're all just trying to do the best of what we have, and we're grateful to have more. Absolutely, I, I, I'm thinking. You know, we're talking about online learning, technology, and and everybody being on the same page to have the the technology that they need. How is that going? Considering I know you're talking about, you know, under mm -hmm. regions and areas. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, sometimes when we say technology it can sound or we rather think of computers and tablets and we have done some of that, but we also, um, if you keep the individual learner in mind, then whenever you give a tablet, you also need to provide the information in multiple manners. So for example, there needs to be a paper workbook, perhaps braille, perhaps a radio program so that the same lesson is provided in different ways so that depending on your learning style, you're able to get the most out of the lesson. And in a lot of um, communities and countries across the world, what has worked best is a combination of maybe radio instructions, maybe sending information through smartphones um, or digital lessons through tablets and computers. Um, we, we've basically adapted to the context that you find on the ground because this has been a global problem and it needs in the, like individualized solutions. So we learn from each other, but with each and every country in context, you really have to think, okay, do they have access to power? Will they be able to charge this tablet? Is that the best way? Um, what kind of learners? Will there be a carer that's able to support if something goes wrong or if they don't understand this or they need support reading it? And then maybe it's about setting up phone calls or um, the smaller peer groups where some of our, uh, in some of our countries, the children are able to meet in smaller groups. So it, it's been a very interesting and challenging learning experience for all of us. Um, but I'm happy to say that we are able to, to support continued learning and, uh, and we continue with it because it's not over yet. How many countries are you involved in working with? Mm -hmm. Um, so last year, perhaps around 14, and now maybe around six, I would say. Um, but some, I mean, because we're, we're global and I'm a technical advisor, say some of the pieces of work that we support in are rolled, rolled out globally without you being involved. So we develop maybe a piece of work or a handbook or something, and then and then it goes and colleagues on the ground uh, contextualize it and start using it. So it's hard to say X amount. I'm, I'm there where I'm needed, so to speak. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, so important. And of course, we all we all have heard of Save the Children. We all know, you know, seen the commercials. We, we know what you know, what it's about. But do you want to share just a little bit about the organization as a whole? Because I know we're talking about it, but we kind, it's kind we're kind of uh, going around the things that you do, but we haven't really described the organization. And then I'd love to get into talking about your books because I'm really excited to. to... Yeah, sure. So, I'm, I mean, I'm really lucky. I, I love what I do and I love my job. And um, I, I really feel like um, my values are, are, are aligned with the organization. Uh, and basically we're, we're an international organization. And what sets us apart is that we have children child rights at its core. So historically, the founders and, and the board have really put child rights at the forefront of most of our discussions, which means that we, we support child advocacy, we lift up their voices, their issues. And that may sound a bit basic, but really it's something that's not that common. Actually, grown-ups make a lot of decisions, um, as we should, but I think there needs to be a space for for children's own agency and, and voices. And, and that's something that Save the Children do. And, and so we are in, we are across the world. We work here in Sweden, just as we work in Rwanda, Bangladesh, Latin America. Um, and we work very closely with partners on the ground as well. Um, 
we work in education, health, nutrition, in crises. Yeah, we're we're, we're pretty large. <laughs> you are. Yeah. And I, that's why I, I ask because I don't think everybody really understands the layers, right? There's yeah. lots of layers within the organization. And yeah. I, I think it's uh, a great thing for people to take a look and see what the work that is done there. Mm -hmm. but let's talk about your work because that's things that I really had. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to um, bring you on, to be honest, because, you know, I feel like there's a lot going on in the world right now. You know, we all know that. And the books that you write are, are really geared so that there are children in this world who get a chance to see themselves through a book, which mm -hmm. is so, so important. So I really would love for you to share you know, from the beginning, what, what, why did you become an author and what your books are really centered around? Hmm, sure. So, you know, I, I often describe myself as an accidental author. Like I never dreamt of being one. I never even considered that I could be one. And perhaps this is one of the issues, right? Maybe if I had met more authors, I would have, I would have had that connection. Um, but I didn't. And, and, I, working in education, I'm around children a lot. And, and I love storytelling, I love engaging children. I've worked as a teacher. So these, all these skills were kind of already there and this interest was there. But when I had my own kids, then it kind of really got closer to me where we were reading more books and uh, my mom is a teacher, my gran is a teacher. Like I, <laughs> the education is all around me. So I knew that that books were gonna be an important, important part of my parenting. And, um, and there were two things that really made me take the leap. The first was that my daughter was a, is a visible minority in Sweden because her skin is brown. And when she was three, she was really struggling with that, with, with being othered. Um, and it wasn't from any negative overt experience, actually. This was just her reflecting on the fact that I don't look like anyone else. And I, I want to be like the people in the in the books, on TV. I, so that was one thing that really struck me hard. And, and I addressed it by, by spending even more time with her. Um, we read more books that showed her people that looked like her. Um, I was more intentional about the kind of cartoons and shows that she watches. Um, and I noticed a change about her, like a real change. Um, there's some of these books where they're, they're um, they offer like little mantras, you know, simple things for children, like I'm beautiful, I'm bold, I'm brave, or I'm smart, or whatever it might be. And, and I found that she, she kind of sucked it in. Um, and at some point, uh, I remember uh, I had made up a song. So <laughs> I made up a, a silly song based on a, a passage in a book that we had read called um, the character's called Jamila. It's by a South African author. Uh, and Ella was singing it to herself. Um, Ella's an African queen, princess, Ella's an African queen, kind of humming along. And I thought, well, isn't that something from being pretty certain that she didn't want to be her anymore? Um, she, she felt good enough in her skin and uh, she started asking to have her hair a certain way or, you know, uh, just coming out of her shell. Um, and she was also very, very, very shy and an introvert and, and all of that was just kind of melting away. Um, and so I, rem I remember thinking this, this, there's something here that, that is bigger than me. And then the final thing was um, after a trip home from the Gambia, um, she asked me, oh, mom, could you find a book about that fruit that we ate at grandma's house? And it's a green fruit called Dita. And we do that at bedtime. I say, okay, choose whatever and I'll get a book, whether it's sushi or dragons or dinosaurs, and then I'll find a book around it. And she asked about this fruit and, um, and I couldn't find it. I looked everywhere and I figured, okay, so these fruits that I grew up on and, and millions of people grew up on and uh, that are native to West Africa, just aren't there for our kids to, to mm -hmm. also get this experience. And that was it. I thought to her, all right, well, tell me about what you enjoyed. And then I built a book around children discovering fruits and, and being an education advisor, I made the book a little more pedagogical with descriptions. And I, I, the other side was a photo. So the child really could, could get the description, get a beautiful illustration and also a real photo of what it looks like. Um, and that was, that's how my first book was, was made really. It was from, uh, from needing to, to fill this void in, in children's literature 
but also knowing the power that books have because I, I had seen it with my own eyes. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not afraid of a no or a challenge. So I just hopped right in and I thought, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> just incredible. You decided to write a book because there was this missing piece about this special fruit right. that people eat. Right. That love. Exactly. And so, so now tell everybody the, the title of the book and where can they get the book? Sure. So the book is called Mangoes and Monkey Bread. And it's available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, everywhere online. Um, and uh, I, I guess one thing that's been really nice that I would like to share about mangoes and monkey bread is, uh, unsurprisingly, people from all over the world have messaged me saying, oh, my goodness, we have this in Mexico or we eat this in Indonesia, places that I may have been or may not, but I see the world connected through this one experience because we all, given the way the children's industry, literature industry is set up, we all read about apples and oranges and pears, which is completely fine, but I would love to discover more. Like, why not? Um, and so that's Mangoes and Monkey Breads really is a, a sweet read. And yeah, you can grab a copy on Amazon. That's incredible. So now you weren't an author, you wrote this children's book. How did you go about figuring out how to become an author, right? Because I think there's people out there, everybody thinks about I, myself. We were talking about this before. Yeah. I'll think about, you know, oh, I'd love to write a book, but it takes, it, you know, it takes a little bit of focus, obviously, <laughs> than a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, any, the tenacity to keep moving forward because there's hurdles that can come up in front of you. So mm -hmm. is there any advice that you have for those aspiring authors out there who have book ideas, but don't, might not do it because of the fact that they don't really know the process? Yes. Yes. No, that's a really good question. One that I didn't ask myself before starting. <laughs> <laughs> so the writing was the easy part, you know? Um, so today, three years later, I, I can now feel comfortable saying I'm an, I'm, I'm a writer. I, I'm a good writer. So that, that came to me quite naturally. Um, but then figuring out what do I do with the script? Um, the, what I've learned is that you can send in your work and traditional publishers can uh, say, oh, yes, we love it. And then they they basically take it and pay you and do all the work for you. Or you can go the long, hard road, which is what I did, and, and do it all yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm in constant learning. So I just took it as a project and I broke it down. So it's a book. What else does it need? It needs art. And you need to find an artist and, and read um, what kind of contracts are available? What kind of partnerships can I establish? And then, and then you do that. Um, and then you find an editor and then you read it again for another hundred times. And then you figure out, well, how am I gonna get published? And it's all there, the information is all there, but I would recommend um, the easiest being Amazon that has a service called KDP, um, where you can upload your books and they will sell and print it for you and send you your royalty checks. Um, and there's way, loads of others. There's another called Ingram Spark um, that also has a similar service. Um, and so that's kind of at a lower cost to you in terms of printing and distribution, but maybe you might have lower royalty sales because they take a higher percentage. Alternatively, you can print in bulk and there's lots of companies that print to your I don't know, 100,000 books or 5,000 books, uh, ship it to your garage, and then you set up a website, and then you sell them yourself. Um, I have a wonderful storage underneath my bed. <laughs> um, and that's great, because it means that globally, people can order from Amazon, but also I have a little stock, and I can show up to community markets or local bookstores, and they can also carry physical copies of my books. So I would say, um, do a little bit of research and find out because it is, like you said, there is step after step. Creating, writing the book is one thing. Then you need to create it and then you need to market it and then you need to sell it. Um, but it is completely doable because um, I did it and I know nothing about this world. <laughs> so I can't imagine your daughter's face when you brought her this book that mom wrote. Like, mm. her, how, how did that go and, and, and yeah. that experience like? So <laughs> it was pretty incredible, actually. You know, last weekend we watched the movie yesterday and the kids turned around and said to me, mom, this is you. Because <laughs> I say yes all the time, apparently. So I'm really, I'm really, um, 
I want them to be like me in that I don't want them to be afraid of a challenge. And so by, by just discussing, shall we have a book with you in it? And then a few months later, being able to hold this, it really removed all the challenges in between for her. It made her think, well, of course, of course I can be in a book. I'm that important. It's doable. Um, and so it has really boosted my children's um, self-awareness and self-importance because they think to themselves, goodness, you know, books are pretty precious things and I'm in one, you know? Um, so it's been, it's been pretty magical. I, I can honestly say that um, as a result of things that we've done consistently, I'm no longer afraid that she will use her voice to stand up for her and that she will stay true to herself. Um, I'll give you another example of something that we did that was insane. Um, she has this brand in, in Sweden called Mini Rodini clothing that she really loves. And she was looking through the photos and she said, mom, couldn't I be a model? And I said, well, of course you can. And she said, but how do we do that? I was like, let's, let's just email and find out. So I sent them an email and we sent them a photo and they said, sure, come on down. And so now this girl took photos and she sees herself on an ad and she goes, oh my goodness. <laughs> And that, oh my goodness, for me was everything. You know, it's like, I, it, there's something important in knowing that things are achievable because it means you don't hesitate to reach for them. Um, and I want that for all children. I want all children to be inspired and think, yes, of course I can be a NASA scientist and a ballerina because I am awesome and I can do this. Um, and so my, my writing is really going along that path of, of writing more and more books where, where children do normal everyday things, but also reach for a little bit more than, than we want them to, well, that we hope that they do, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, number one, what an amazing inspiration you are to your own children and to all those people listening out there to be able to say, not only did you write a book, but your daughter who said, here, I wanna be a model or I want the mm -hmm. opportunity, you picked up the phone and you did what you needed to do. And here she is now. Like it really just showcases that if you go for what you want, right. you get some no's along the way. And there might be some obstacles and stumbling. Right. right. At the end of the day, you there's a learning. I, I, the word fit, exactly. I don't even think it should be in the language because we learn from everything that doesn't go the way we want it to. Exactly. But when it's when when things happen like it happened for you and for your daughter, um, the celebrations that need to happen for those wins are you know mm -hmm. really need to always make sure to celebrate them and really show you're showing your own children and and those who are listening and and your children's friends who are seeing all this happen yeah. that all anything you want is definitely possible. But I know you wrote another book about it and it and it's about the ballet, right? Mm, yeah. So this is my son. It's his turn. <laughs> So my son is now four and he started ballet at age three um, and he was one of those sickly kids, but he could always dance before he could walk and, and he could sing before he could talk. And I knew he, he had some sort of creative soul in him. I could see that from day one. Whilst my daughter is actually, she's into math and forms and shapes and she just kind of explores what's out there in the creative world. And so um, because my daughter does dance, we had lots of lots of dance books and ballet books, and uh, we tried our best to get ones that were inclusive and showed children from all over the world. And and my son, we were reading one night, and he just he just said, "But where is me?" And I thought, in his three year old language, and I thought, "Yeah, Lou, there aren't enough boys in here, and there aren't enough boys who are brown, and there aren't enough boys with with their curly hair or afro locks." And he said, but I want me. And I said, well, let's fix it. And so we're writing that story. So we're writing a story about a boy and a girl who start ballet and they are from the African diaspora, they're brown. Um, and they meet friends of all abilities and body shapes and ethnicities. And it's it's quite a simple story about working together um, to, to get for a Christmas show. But I wrote this story differently. Like normally story, something happens that needs fixing or, um, and that gives a story an arc, right? Uh, and I decided, actually, I want this one to be about the journey rather than what happens here. So I noticed in my kids, for example, that I could give them the same situation and I would see one hyperventilating whilst the other one was over the moon. And I thought that's, that's you know, that's kind of what I want to capture. 
that, um, that it's the first day of class and how is that gonna feel for you? And it's the first time you do this and how's that gonna feel for you? And naturally because it's ballet, I just hint at some of the comments that when we walk down the street with both kids, people always go to my daughter, goodness, what a cute ballerina and never nothing at my son. Or they're like, oh, you're going to watch your sister. And he, and he remembers. And so, so there are hints in there of what are the things that you, they could face, but it's not actually a big part of the story. It's literally kids join the class and they make wonderful friends and they work hard and they have a beautiful show at the end because I want all children to, to dance. I mean, dance is the most free expression of, of humanity, of joy, of emotions, and absolutely everybody dances. And somehow when you look at dance books, there's only a certain kind of somebody dancing. Um, and so that's, that's, that's really quite sad. And I hope that my book, it's called Ballet with Heart, it's coming out this summer, will do, will do some of that. And, um, and I've gotten, uh, I've gotten such great response about this book. It's been so, so nice. I mean, I have uh, at least three professional ballet dancers who have written a little inspirational notes to a young ballerina, which was part of the book. Uh, we went to the school and did a photo shoot with some of the kids because I wanted to, I wanted real photos. I want children to see this. It's not just a story. I want you to see these kids and that could be you. Um, and so there'll be some photos at the back. And this is why this book isn't traditionally published because I want it to be my project, my learning project. I want, um, I want it to be a little bit out of the norm, um, but I'm so excited. <laughs> I can see it and I am so excited for you. And I think you know a little bit about the foundation that mm. I started in that our goal is, is to, you know, what, what our mission is, is we help children in the underserved communities be able to take ongoing lessons in dance, acting, and yes. vocal instruction. And when I looked at your, you know, um, the cover of your book, and I read a little bit about what you were doing, I said, it, it really, and it's sad to say, was a true epiphany to me to say, wow, we have so many kids of all different backgrounds, mm. fund, right? Mm. But they're not reading books that represent them. Right. They see themselves in these books. Right. And, and that's why I know I want us to, to buy some of them <laughs> and, and give them to those kids because it is so important and we cannot be numb to the fact that a lot of our culture, when it comes to the books, the picture books for kids, they are not seeing themselves in these books. And some of us, it is something we're and we, we cannot ignore that that has been going on for a very long time. And we need more authors like yourself who are doing these types of things to bring this. Who doesn't want to see themselves in a book? And you're right. to be able to say that. It's, he, you said he was around three? when he Yes. Realized. So now, yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so children are intuitive, you know, they notice what's around them. And sometimes they don't have the language to articulate it, but they notice and, and this is the good thing. This is why I stay in education and research because I want to understand how that affects them. And, um, and what we know is that children reach for what they can see, right? So if we put a ceiling on their dreams, there will be that ceiling. It takes a rather extraordinary person to do it on their own. Um, and so that's my goal, really. I kind of decided very early on that there'll just be a dash next to whatever they want to. So she wants to be an astronaut, stroke, dancer, stroke, chef, stroke, mathematician. And I'm like, yes, indeed, astronauts need somebody to cook for them up there. <laughs> you can be whatever. And, and it's just about, you know, thinking about uh, not just the dreams, but, but also making a connection to those things. So if, if you have a child who's interested in cooking, and first of all, I just want to say this, all children should cook, please. Yeah, boys and girls, they should play with the play kitchen, but then you as a parent can bring them into the kitchen with you, right? They're really good at sorting out your vegetables, mixing the salads with their hands. There's so much we can do that make these dreams more than just a dream. You take them one step forward and you encourage and give praise, like, look at what you've made. And then you're really setting this thing, really, you're giving it roots in their hearts and mind so that they can then continue and, and go on this journey without you. Right. Or take a new one. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. And that positive reinforcement is mm -hmm. so, so important. And, and I love what you said in the fact that boys and girls together, yeah. 
you know, all, all, you know, no matter what, everybody should be in the kitchen. Everybody can stay with the play kitchen. Every, you know, it, it doesn't have to be one or the other. And, and I think that's so, so important. Um, you know, we're talking about the differences in, in, in the books and, and things like that, but, you know, we know in, in the world, there's a lot going on. And what's important to me that I really wanted to talk to you about, I mean, being, you've been to so many different countries, you've lived in so many different countries and you've seen the different issues that have been going on. But now, now we are looking at social justice in a very different way. And the conversations, they happened because something happened, you know, right. here in the, in the US and, um, and it's happening all over. But how do we keep the conversation? I have so many questions around this for you because you've seen so many different things. Um, how do we keep the conversation going? What needs to be done? And how do we tell our children and explain to children what's going on? As my daughters are barking, as you, I'm sure you can hear. Don't <laughs> it's okay. I have, I have my pup right, right under me and he's bribed with a nice chew stick. So no worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, so conversation's happening. I'll start with the children because that's kind of where my heart will is. Um, I think books, books is the one greatest tool that I use to address pretty much everything in our in our lives, whether it's grief, social justice issues, food, there's always a smart book that you can read and it brings you closer without actually having to focus on the you in that moment. So then we can read a book about Ida who maybe has had a tough time at school with bullying. And then we can have a conversation um, and have a dialogue and build on her experience and say, what do you think? Well, have you seen this? How does that make you feel? What do you think we could do differently? Is there something I could do differently? Is there something I could be addressing with you? And, um, and I think we really shouldn't underestimate children's voices and their ability to understand complicated situations. Um, they're right here living this world just as we are. Um, and so the one greatest tool I would say is to, is to lean on children's books and be choosy, you know? Thankfully, uh, there is a wave towards more inclusive and diverse books, um, which means that there's more out there. It just still means you have to look. Um, so they might not be on the top shelf in the bookstore, but they are there and they're available to order. Um, and people should feel free to message me. I'm, I'm very happy to recommend books about different things. And so for my children, that's kind of the way we go. Um, we start with a good book. And with regards to social issues, how to keep the conversation going, I think you need to, to be true to you and keep those conversations going uh, and make sure that you don't let an opportunity pass by or, or situation pass by where you were supposed to address something, but something inside you felt a little uh, scared, right? Because these are difficult situations and we often do feel scared. And it's okay to say that that's a natural human emotion, just like joy, and we grow through it, but we must push through. If not, we will stay static, and that's not what we want. Um, so what I would really love to see is more conversations, which is why I'm so happy to, to speak to you, because conversation with an open mind so that you're ready to learn from my perspective, and I'm ready to learn and listen to your perspective, right? There's an importance uh, in having the right kind of conversation. Um, and I read something really smart that said, in all conversations, you need to be ready to accept the fact that actually you might be wrong, right? Because mm -hmm. we often discuss based on something you know or learned or facts or, or whatever it is, it has to be really an open process. Um, I know a lot of what happened with the Black Lives Matter movement really created a deep, deep, change in me personally, because even though I had been working on inclusion and I live at, as a black mom uh, from the African diaspora here, and I did all sorts of things like uh, work with children, serve on boards. Um, I did a lot of things around inclusion and addressing race, um, but I would never speak about it because, you know, it makes other people uncomfortable. It's not something you want to bring into a room. And what Black Lives Matters did is it actually made me speak out and really loud and said, actually, this is not something that happens far away. It happens pretty much every day in everyone's lives. Um, we are all touched by it in some way, if not by personal interactions, but because of the systemic things that go on. So just by bringing it on the table, I think is important. And then we need to unpack slowly and surely and realize that it's always going to be a process, but it's a process that can't be stagnant because we don't want to repeat generational issues. 
again. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I feel about the activism. I feel like existing currently is being an activist because I want every single action book uh, talk to to bring learning and light and change to people. Um, and so that's actually really, really important to me. And um, and I'm really glad to see some of the changes just in the in the children's literature industry to see so many beautiful books coming out addressing different issues. Um, I see it in in a lot of movements. I was reading your web page as well, and I thought, isn't this isn't this you know what we want to see? Um, and so I, I'm I'm kind of on the hopeful side of the pendulum most times. I, I'm very optimistic, and, and I'm pleased to see some change. And I'm just perhaps worried at the back of my mind that we will start to forget and move on to other things. Um, yeah, so so the systematic things, the system, systemic things, they are the ones that kind of, we need uh, we need politicians and leaders to get a grip, right? There's this only so much we as an individual can do. We want organizations to take a look at themselves and, um, and start addressing these things through policy and advocacy, et cetera, so yeah. And, you know, um, it's interesting because what you said before about, you know, being open to if we make mistakes in what we, mm. say, you know, mm. I think that I was brought up in a really interesting way, right? We were brought up and, it, and I realize now with all that's happened, I thought it was the right way, but it wasn't. But we were brought up with the way of everybody, nobody is different. Mm. Everybody's the same. Mm. There's no color difference. We are all just human beings. We are all people. And so we, we did not see boundaries. We saw mm. everybody equal. Mm. And that was, I always thought was a really great thing. Mm. Realizing mm. it isn't. Because mm. everybody had their own thing that they were going through in a very mm. different way. And I didn't know that that was happening. So I was blind to that. Mm. It was very interesting. And so you're thinking like, this is good. You know, I brought up my kids. We are all human beings, no matter what shape, no matter what size, no matter what color. Mm. Yeah. But in essence, that's almost being colorblind and mm. is not a good thing either because we want to make sure that, you know, we know that when um, when some of us get pulled over, you know what I mean? It's very different mm. for others. Mm. And I had that, oh my gosh, moment mm. when I realized that. Many people, many millions of people had had that, oh my gosh, moments. And, and I think... Um, I often reflect on this, that, that that's kind of how we defined fairness, you know, to be fair, everyone has to be the same. And, um, and I, 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 in raising my children, I, I constantly remind them and repeat and give them the examples so that they can see that being fair is, is not giving you both the same. For example, uh, my son doesn't like candy. He likes salty stuff. So he likes pretzels and, and salami. And my daughter likes ice cream. So if they say, mom, can I have a snack? And I say, do you want your favorite snack? Something really yummy. And they go, yes. If I get the same thing, one of you will be really unhappy, right? And that's just not fair because I know you. And they, so they, through simple examples like that, they can see that, that giving you exactly the same is not being fair. And that's kind of the, the way that um, that I try and illustrate the the importance of seeing the individual in in my line of work and every time I've worked in a classroom, it's always been really important to see the learner. If you know this learner cannot see so well and you put them at the back of the class just because they're the tallest, then you're being deeply unfair. You know, we have to see each and every single learner and adapt as much as we can to what their needs are. And that's exactly what we see in society where with regards to uh, race is that we cannot ignore it. And, um, and I think that's really, really kind of just the fundamental, you know, just see me, you know, don't ignore a specific part of me, but also be ready to know that me might be quite a complicated thing, you know, it's not very, uh, it's, in fact, it's never black or white, it's very much in the nuances of the grays, and if in doubt, ask, you know, if you're unsure, ask, if we make mistakes, apologize. When we go to school, and my daughter sees a lady with a red dot on her head, and says, mom, 
why does she have her head painted? And I say, oh, it's part of her culture. Hi, this mom, hi, this is something's mom. Why, why do you wear, uh, that's what my daughter said, why do you wear a red dot on the head? And she got a little education and now she knows. It's not a weird thing to ask, you know? Um, it also prevents othering because you understand and then you can move on, right? Um, and I think that's the, that's the thing when you come into contact with people from all over the places with all sorts of cultures and ethnicities, you have to come with the humility that you will not know anything, everything. Um, and it's important to be open enough to ask, but to, to not ignore. I think we do more harm in ignoring um, than in asking questions. But when you ask, you also become more vulnerable because you, you show yourself as not knowing all the answers. Um, so I, I, I can understand that it's really complicated, but I'm really pleased with the conversations that I've had and I've been listening to since the Black Lives Matters movement. And, um, and I'm just really hopeful for the momentum to continue. Same. And, and like you said, keeping the conversations going, we all, we all need to learn. And, and it is so true. And I can't say this enough for those who are listening, ask the questions. And if you make a mistake, apologize and mean it and and learn from it and that's how we can all continue to grow so thank you for that and and thank you for you know the the insight especially i feel like if we could all be as curious as children because right, right. Ask all these questions all the time yeah yeah and they yeah, don't but, do it with animosity they do it mm. with just real curiosity their eyes are big to the world mm. and one thing i just wanted to ask about that is that if we do enough homework then actually we don't have so many questions or it wouldn't be on the same scale. So if you were reading broadly and your children do discover Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism through books, the first time they met someone, they would be able to associate those things, right? And it would make sense. So for example, a Sikh having their hair covered, I remember I remember my daughter explaining to my son that that's what, that's, oh yeah, they, they cover their hair because of religion. And then off she went and she was done with that. You know, there's no mysticism or, you know, you don't have time for that to fester. And as adults, we should also do the homework, read, mm -hmm. right? Uh, find out. Um, it, will, it, it will remove that awkwardness and the questions if that's not where you're comfortable. Just there's, there's a lot that's been written and that's readily available for us to increase our knowledge about our prejudice, power, people, culture, religion. It's all there. Um, we just didn't need to do a bit of work. I would say. Absolutely. Mm. Very, mm. very true. Take the time. Do mm. the learning. Mm. So what is next for Emily? <laughs> so actually in a uh... Uh, on the 25th of May, I have another book coming out. Um, this book through a traditional publisher. So that's what I'm actually looking forward to. It's a book called The, the Deep Blue. It's going to be published in Swedish first. Um, and uh, it's about a child who is afraid of, of the water, of swimming. Uh, again, another true story in our lives. I can't swim or I just learned to swim. <laughs> ish um, and, and it was quite an interesting thing looking at myself trying to get my children to feel comfortable in the water when I myself couldn't and so that story is coming out um, and I'm also uh, really working on a children's book around children's rights no surprise there um, I find that there's lots of tools to talk about to children about their rights when they're a certain age but not really for the little little three-year-olds and I've had such nice conversation with preschool children about what their rights are and, and what it feels like to be heard. What are the important things that they want um, their opinion on? And it could just be about ice cream, but it's still an important opinion, you know? Um, like I asked some kids the other day, well, what are some of the things you would like adults to ask you about? And they said, whether we can wear a twirly skirt when we twirl. And I said, well, yes, that's very important indeed. The, the <laughs> twirl factor is very important. And I thought, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if children had access to those kind of discussions? So I'm working on that, um, on that book and, and, uh, and just trying to, to be present in parenthood. That's something that I constantly work at. Uh, and that's it, I, I don't have grand plans. Uh, I'm not that kind of person. I kind of roll with the flow and see what's going to come up next. 
have to say you don't have grand plans, but you are being, you are a published author. I think that <laughs> yeah. is like a hugely grand plan. Um, yeah. so, so kudos to you for Thank seeing you. something you do, but yeah. it, I'm telling you, I know it'll inspire others mm -hmm. because you said that was not your background. No, you just, these books were needed. You found something that was a need, but you created a solution. Mm -hmm. That is just a beautiful thing, Emily. So kudos you for what you're doing for for kids all all over the world that are going to get the opportunity to read your books thank you that's incredible and so where can people find you if they want to talk to you or if they want to find your books yeah so i've got a website it's www.mbife.com bife.com and it's got my books my blog and my contact details if you want to get in touch but i'm also on facebook same um, bife uh, i've got a page and on instagram bife books and twitter and my social media is dedicated to recommending books that we like and enjoy um so if you're looking for book recommendations that's where to go um yeah so feel free to drop me an email particularly if you want to write a book and you just need somebody to cheerlead you down the way. I, I think um, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Now, Bifa, Bifa, right? Am I saying Bifa. it? Bifa. Bifa. <laughs> yeah. Now, you were telling me what it means. Can you tell everybody what it means? I think yes, yes. Bifa is uh, the word in Bambara for I love you. And Bambara is a language spoken in Mali in West Africa. And for those of you who don't know Mali, it's where Timbuktu is, which is pretty famous uh, it's a city there uh, and it also has the world's oldest libraries um or some of the world's oldest libraries so it's really uh it's where my mom is from and it's a pretty awesome country and when I had my daughter that kind of the Mbife kind of was at the back of my mind like I want to do a project around love uh, and so it became Bife books so yeah that's the name of my company that's incredible. I love the meaning. Isn't it great when you can just create meaning behind things? And but the funny part is nobody really knows. But then when they no. like, wow, yeah. that's <laughs> yeah, so that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, Emily, I definitely want to have you on more because I I think you have so much insight and 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 I know that I feel like in six months. I, who know you'll have a whole library of books by that. <laughs> I, I wouldn't put yeah. it past myself. <laughs> I, I'm not going to get past yeah. you either, but I, I want to ask you uh, the question I ask every guest, uh, the last question, um, which is an important one because I think there's so much learning from these things. What If you knew then what you know now, what would that be or it could be more than one thing? Um, if I knew what then what I knew now. Um, so parenting, I would have been better prepared. <laughs> I think because I work in child development, I assumed that you could be really good at this, you know, by just reading the books. And um, and motherhood was surprisingly challenging. Um, so was pregnancy and breastfeeding. And I felt like there was just myths around parenting and motherhood, but nobody told me the real deal. Um, so I find it to have been really kind of pivotal in my life in that it was so difficult uh, and I learned so so much and I love it so much. My children are my everything. And it brought me here because I've been writing little things for ages, but I always say it's like I was scribbling before. And when I had my kids, my writing got direction, it got purpose. And so I would never be an author if I hadn't become a mother. So it's it's kind of a weird, a weird cycle. Uh yeah. Uh I'm not sure if that answered the question, but to, to be more prepared, I would say, to have more of a, a tribe around me for, for, for motherhood, to do those kind of things, to take time, to rest, <laughs> those kind of things. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned this because I say motherhood is the most selfless or parenting is the most selfless job mm -hmm. that you can ever have. It is the most fulfilling and rewarding. Mm -hmm. We don't go in, there's no rule yeah. book. There's lots of books. But there's no specific because every child is uniquely mm. different, so there can't be one rule book for every right. child. Um, and who would want yeah. that? It's just that as a person, when you're going into parenting, we I don't think we are prepared all, all the time, fully mm. prepared for what you're what you're about to endure for. You never go back to being that <laughs> mom, you know, what right? I mean? Right. They never get to meet that person. Like we look at photos and they're like, 
is that you? And I'm like, yeah, you know, they, they, they never get to see me as singing in choir or playing basketball. That's like another person. They know this person <laughs> with rolls and bags <laughs> under her eyes. <laughs> It's, it's all love. <laughs> it's all love. It's wisdom. It's all that we bring to it. Yes. Our, yes. Our ever-changing bodies and, and all of that. And and they learn that it's to roll with the punches like we do. But it it is one of, you know, parenting is one of those things that um I don't know until you're, you know, my mom used to say this to me all the time. Until you're a parent, you'll never understand. Mm. Right. Right. <laughs> she used to say that, but she was right. Yes. I don't know about you, Emily, but I've never slept the same again. <laughs> no, no. Sleep, what is that? <laughs> and my kids are, wait, how old are your kids again? They're only seven and four, so I'm still kind of in it. <laughs> oh, you're in it. Mine are 22 yes. and 19, and oh, I still wow. don't sleep the same. Oh, yeah. no, give me hope, Jody. No. <laughs> I sleep. I do sleep, Emily, yeah. but it's still not the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that you'll come back and give us an update. I, I definitely, again, just one more time, website for everybody. Where where can they find your books and your information? So www.bife.com, M-B-I-F-E. Or you can look for me on Amazon because they have all my current books. So it's Emily Joof, E-M-I-L-Y, and then J-O-O-F. That might be an easy way to find me. That's awesome. I, I can't tell you how excited I was to have this interview with you yes. for such great insight. And like I said, we'll have you back on again. And th- I really appreciate you sharing so much with us today. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure having a conversation. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I'm going to say what I always say at the end of every podcast. Today is the day. You cannot go back to yesterday and you do not yet own tomorrow. So what steps, big or small, are you going to take today to get yourself just a little bit closer to your goals? Have a fabulous week, everyone. And thanks again, Emily. Thank you.